Chapter 84 The Hotel Sands was the best in the city of Los Angeles. It was an old hotel, but it had class and a charm missing from the newer places. It was directly across from the park downtown. It was renowned for businessmen's conventions and expensive hookers of almost legendary talent who at the end of a lucrative evening had even been known to give the bellboys a little. There also were stories of bellboys who had become millionaires, bloody bellboys with 11-inch dicks who had had the good fortune to meet and marry some rich, elderly guest, and the food, the lobster, the huge black chefs in very tall white hats who knew everything, not only about food, but about life, and about me, and about everything. I was assigned to the loading dock. That loading dock had style. For each truck that came in there were ten guys to unload it, when it only took two at the most. I wore my best clothes. I never touched anything. We unloaded, they unloaded, everything that came into the hotel, and most of it was foodstuffs. My guess was that the rich ate more lobster than anything else. Crates and crates of them would come in, deliciously pink and large, waving their claws and feelers. You like those things, don't you, Chinoski? Yeah. Oh yeah. I drool. One day the lady in the employment office called me over. The employment office was at the rear of the loading dock. I want you to manage this office on Sundays, Chinoski. What do I do? Just answer the phone and hire the Sunday dishwashers. All right. The first Sunday was nice. I just sat there. Soon an old guy walked in. Yeah, buddy, I asked. He had on an expensive suit, but it was wrinkled and a little dirty, and the cuffs were just starting to go. He was holding his hat in his hand. Listen, he asked, do you need somebody who is a good conversationalist? Somebody who can meet and talk to people. I have a certain amount of charm. I tell gracious stories. I can make people laugh. Yeah? Oh, yes. Make me laugh. Oh, you don't understand. The setting has to be right. The mood, the decor, you know. Make me laugh, sir. Can't use you. You're stiff. The dishwashers were hired at noon. I stepped out of the office. Forty bums stood there. All right, now. We need five good men. Five good ones. No winos, perverts, communists, or child molesters. And you've got to have a social security card. All right, now. Get them out and hold them up in the air. Out came the cards. They waved them. Hey, I got one. Hey, buddy, over here. Give a guy a break. I slowly looked them over. Okay. You with the shit stain on your collar, I pointed. Step forward. That's no shit stain, sir. That's gravy. Well, I don't know, buddy. Looks to me like you've been eating more crotch than roast beef. Ah, ha, 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 went the bums. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Okay, now I need four good dishwashers. I have four pennies here in my hand. I'm going to toss them up. The four men who bring me back a penny... Get to wash dishes today. I tossed the pennies high into the air above the crowd. Bodies jumped and fell. Clothing ripped. There were curses. One man screamed. There were several fistfights. Then the lucky four came forward, one at a time, breathing heavily, each with a penny. I gave them their work cards and waved them toward the employee's cafeteria, where they would first be fed. The other bums retreated slowly down the loading ramp, jumped off, and walked down the alley into the wasteland of downtown Los Angeles on a Sunday. Chapter 85 Sundays were best because I was alone and soon I began to take a pint of whiskey to work with me. One Sunday, after a hard night's drinking, the bottle got to me. I blacked out. I vaguely remembered some unusual activity that evening after I went home, but it was unclear. I told Jan about it the next morning before I went back to work. I think I fucked up, 
but maybe it's my imagination. I went in and walked up to the time clock. My time card was not in the rack. I turned and walked over to the old lady who ran the employment office. When she saw me, she looked nervous. Mrs. Farrington, my time card is missing. Henry, I always thought you were such a nice boy. Yes? You don't remember what you did, do you? She asked, looking nervously around. No, ma'am. You were drunk. You cornered Mr. Pelvington in the men's locker room, and you wouldn't let him out. You held him captive for 30 minutes. What did I do to him? You wouldn't let him out. Who is he? The assistant manager of this hotel. What else did I do? You were lecturing him on how to run this hotel. Mr. Pelvington has been in the hotel business for 30 years. You suggested that prostitutes be registered on the first floor only and that they should be given regular physical examinations. There are no prostitutes in this hotel, Mr. Chinoski. Oh, I know that, Mrs. Pelvington. Farrington. Mrs. Farrington. You also told Mr. Pelvington that only two men were needed on the loading dock instead of ten, and that it would cut down on the theft if each employee was given one live lobster to take home each night in a specially constructed cage that could be carried on buses and streetcars. You have a real sense of humor, Mrs. Farrington. The security guard couldn't get you to let go of Mr. Pelvington. You tore his coat. It was only after we called the regular police that you relented. I presume I'm terminated. You have presumed correctly, Mr. Chinoski. I walked off behind a stack of crates. When Mrs. Farrington wasn't looking, I cut for the employee's cafeteria. I still had my food card. I could get one last good meal. The stuff was nearly as good as what they cooked for the guest upstairs. Plus, they gave the help more of it. Clutching my food card, I walked into the cafeteria, picked up a tray, a knife and fork, a cup and some paper napkins. I walked up to the food counter. Then I looked up. Tacked to the wall behind the counter was a piece of white cardboard covered with a large crude scrawl. Don't give any food to Henry Chinoski. I put the tray back unnoticed. I walked out of the cafeteria. I walked along the loading dock. Then I jumped into the alley. Coming toward me was another bum. Got a smoke, buddy? he asked. Yeah. I took out two, gave him one, took one myself. I lit him up, then I lit myself up. He moved east, and I moved west. Chapter 86 The farm labor market was at 5th and San Pedro streets. You reported at 5 a.m. It was still dark when I got there. Men were sitting and standing around, rolling cigarettes and talking quietly. All such places always have the same smell. The smell of stale sweat, urine, and cheap wine. The day before, I had helped Jan move in with a fat real estate operator who lived on Kingsley Drive. I'd stood back out of sight in the hall and watched him kiss her. Then they'd gone into his apartment together and the door had closed. I had walked back down the street alone, noticing for the first time the pieces of blown paper and accumulated trash that littered the street. We'd been evicted from our apartment. I had two dollars eight cents. Jan promised me she'd be waiting when my luck changed, but I hardly believed that. The real estate operator's name was Jim Bemis. He had an office on Alvarado Street and plenty of cash. I hate it when he fucks me, Jan had said. She was now probably saying the same thing about me to him. Oranges and tomatoes were piled in several crates and apparently were free. I took an orange, bit into the skin, and sucked on it. I had exhausted my unemployment benefits since leaving the Sands Hotel. A guy about 40 walked up to me. His hair looked dyed. In fact, it didn't look like human hair, but more like thread. The hard overhead light shone down on him. He had brown moles on his face, mostly clustered around his mouth. One or two black hairs grew out of each one. 
How you doing? He asked. Okay. How'd you like a blowjob? No, I don't think so. I'm hot, man. I'm excited. I really do it good. Listen, I'm sorry. I'm not in the mood. He walked off angrily. I looked about the large room. There were 50 men waiting. There were 10 or 12 state employment clerks sitting at their desk or walking around. They smoked cigarettes and looked more worried than the bums. The clerks were separated from the bums by a heavy wire mesh fence that went from floor to ceiling. Somebody had painted it yellow. It was a very indifferent yellow. When a clerk had to make a transaction with a bum, he unlocked and slid open a small glass window in the wire. When the paperwork was taken care of, the clerk would slide the glass window shut, lock it from the inside, and each time it happened, hope seemed to vanish. We all came awake when the window would slide open. Any man's chance was our chance, but when it closed, hope evaporated. Then we had each other to look at. Along the back wall, behind the yellow screen and behind the clerks, were six blackboards. There was white chalk and erasers, just like in grammar school. Five of the blackboards were washed clean, although it was possible to see the ghost of previous messages, of jobs long filled and now lost forever, as far as we were concerned. There was a message on the sixth blackboard, Tomato Pickers Wanted in Baker's Field. I had thought that the machines had put the tomato pickers out of work. Yet there it was. Humans apparently were less expensive than machines. And machines broke down. Ah. I looked around the waiting room. There were no Orientals, no Jews, almost no blacks. Most of the bums were poor whites or Chicano. The one or two blacks were already drunk on wine. Now one of the clerks stood up. He was a big man with a beer gut. What you noticed was his yellow shirt with vertical black stripes. The shirt was overstarched, and he wore armbands to hold up his sleeves like in photographs taken in the 90s. He walked over and unlocked the glass window in the yellow screen. All right, there's a truck in back loading up for Bakersfield. He slid the window shut, locked it, sat down at his desk, and lit a cigarette. For a moment, nobody moved. Then one by one, those sitting on the benches began to get up and stretch, their faces expressionless. The men who had been standing dropped their cigarettes on the floor and put them out carefully with the soles of their shoes. Then a slow general exodus began. Everyone filed out a side door into a fenced yard. The sun was coming up. We really looked at each other for the first time. A few men grinned at the sight of a familiar face. We stood in a line, pushing our way toward the back of the truck, the sun coming up. It was time to get going. We were climbing into a World War II Army truck with a high canvas roof, torn. We moved forward, pushing rudely, but at the same time trying to be at least half polite. Then I got tired of the elbows. I stepped back. The truck's capacity was admirable. The big Mexican foreman stood to one side at the back of the truck, waving them on in. All right, all right, let's go, let's go. The men moved forward slowly, as if into the mouth of the whale. Through the side of the truck, I could see the faces. They were talking quietly and smiling. At the same time, I disliked them and felt lonely. Then I decided I could handle tomatoes. I decided to get in. Someone banged into me from behind. It was a fat Mexican woman and she seemed quite emotional. I took her by the hips and boosted her. She was very heavy. She was hard to manage. Finally, I got hold of something. It seemed one of my hands had slipped into the deepest recess of her crotch. I boosted her in. Then I reached up to get a grip and pull myself in. I was the last one. The Mexican foreman put his foot on my hand. No, he said, we've got enough. The truck's engine started, stalled, stopped. The driver hit it again. 
It started and they rolled off. Chapter 87 Workmen for Industry was located right on the edge of Skid Row. The bums were better dressed, younger, but just as listless. They sat around on the window ledges, hunched forward, getting warm in the sun and drinking the free coffee that WFI offered. There was no cream and sugar, but it was free. There was no wire partition separating us from the clerks. The telephones rang more often, and the clerks were much more relaxed than at the farm labor market. I walked up to the counter and was given a card in a pen anchored by a chain. Fill it out, said the clerk, a nice-looking Mexican boy who tried to hide his warmth behind a professional manner. I began to fill out the card. After address and phone number, I wrote, none. Then after education and work abilities, I wrote, two years L.A. City College, journalism and fine arts. Then I told the clerk, I ruined this card. Could I have another? He gave me one. I wrote instead, graduate L.A. High School, shipping clerk, warehouse man, laborer, some typing. I handed the card back. All right, said the clerk. Sit down and we'll see if anything comes in. I found a space on a window ledge and sat down. An old black man was sitting next to me. He had an interesting face. He didn't have the usual resigned look that most of us sitting around the room had. He looked as if he was attempting not to laugh at himself and the rest of us. He saw me glancing at him. He grinned. Guy who runs this place is sharp. He got fired by the farm labor, got pissed, came down here and started this. Specializes in part-time workers. Some guy wants a boxcar unloaded quick and cheap. He calls here. Yeah, I've heard. Guy needs a boxcar unloaded quick and cheap. He calls here. Guy who runs this place takes 50%. We don't complain. We take what we can get. It's okay with me. Shit. You look down in the mouth. You all right? Lost a woman. You'll have others and lose them too. Where do they go? Try some of this. It was a bottle in a bag. I took a hit. Port wine. Thanks. Ain't no women on Skid Row. He passed the bottle to me again. Don't let him see us drinking. That's the one thing makes him mad. While we sat drinking, several men were called and left for jobs. It cheered us. At least there was some action. My black friend and I waited, passing the bottle back and forth. Then it was empty. Where's the nearest liquor store, I asked. I got the directions and left. Somehow it was always hot on Skid Row in Los Angeles in the daytime. You'd see old bums walking around in heavy overcoats in the heat. But when the night came down and the mission was full, those overcoats came in handy. When I got back from the liquor store, my friend was still there. I sat down and opened the bottle, passed the bag. Keep it low, he said. It was comfortable in there drinking the wine. A few gnats began to gather and circle in front of us. Wine gnats, he said. Sons of bitches are hooked. They know what's good. They drink to forget their women. They just drink. I waved at them in the air and got one of the wine gnats. When I opened my hand, all I could see in my palm was a speck of black and the strange sight of two little wings. Zero. Here he comes. It was the nice-looking young guy who ran the place. He rushed up to us. All right, get out of here. Get the hell out of here, you fucking winos. Get the hell out of here before I call the cops. He hustled us both to the door, pushing and cursing. I felt guilty but I felt no anger. Even as he pushed, I knew that he didn't really care what we did. He had a large ring on his right hand. We didn't move fast enough, and I caught the ring just over my left eye. I felt the blood start to come, and then felt it swell up. My friend and I were back out on the street. We walked away. We found a doorway and sat on the step. I handed him the bottle. He hid it. Good stuff. He handed me the bottle. I hit it. Yeah, good stuff. Sun's up. Yeah, 
the sun's up good. We sat quietly, passing the bottle back and forth. Then the bottle was empty. Well, he said, I gotta be going. See you. He walked off. I got up, went the other way, turned the corner, and walked up Main Street. I went along until I came to the Roxy. Photos of the strippers were on display behind the glass out front. I walked up and bought a ticket. The girl in the cage looked better than the photos. Now I had 38 cents left. I walked into the dark theater eight rows from the front. The first three rows were packed. I had lucked out. The movie was over and the first stripper was already on. Darlene. The first was usually the worst. An old timer come down. Now reduced to kicking leg in the chorus line most of the time. We had Darlene for openers. Probably somebody had been murdered or was on the rag or was having a screaming fit and this was Darlene's chance to dance solo again. But Darlene was fine, skinny but with breast, a body like a willow. At the end of that slim back, that slim body was an enormous behind. It was like a miracle, enough to drive a man crazy. Darlene was dressed in a long black velvet gown, slit very high. Her calves and thighs were dead white against the black. She danced and looked out at us through heavily mascarad eyes. This was her chance. She wanted to come back, to be a featured dancer once again. I was with her. As she worked at the zippers, more and more of her began to show, to slip out of that sophisticated black velvet, leg and white flesh. Soon she was down to her pink bra and G-string, the fake diamond swinging and flashing as she danced. Darlene danced over and grabbed the stage curtain. The curtain was torn and thick with dust. She grabbed it, dancing to the beat of the four-man band and in the light of the pink spotlight. She began to fuck that curtain. The band rocked in rhythm. Darlene really gave it to that curtain. The band rocked and she rocked. The pink light abruptly switched to purple. The band stepped it up, played all out. She appeared to climax. Her head fell back. Her mouth opened. Then she straightened and danced back to the center of the stage. From where I was sitting, I could hear her singing to herself over the music. She took a hold of her pink bra and ripped it off, and a guy three rows down lit a cigarette. There was just the G-string now. She pushed her finger into her belly button and moaned. Darlene remained dancing at stage center. The band was playing very softly. She began a gentle grind. She was fucking us. The beaded G-string was swaying slowly. Then the four-man band began to pick up gradually once again. They were reaching for the culmination of the act. The drummer was cracking rim shots like firecrackers. They looked tired, desperate. Darlene fingered her naked breast, showing them to us, her eyes filled with the dream, her lips moist and parted. Then suddenly she turned and waved her enormous behind at us. The beads leaped and flashed, went crazy, sparkled. The spotlight shook and danced like the sun. The four-man band crackled and banged. Darlene spun around. She tore away the beads. I looked. They looked. We could see her cunt hairs through the flesh-colored gauze. The band really spanked her ass. And I couldn't get it up.